Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Space Warfighter Talks. I'm your host, Bill Wolf, the president and founder of the Space Force Association. I'd like to welcome you on this very special day, National Space Day. National Space Day dedicates the first Friday in May to the extraordinary achievements, benefits, and opportunities in the exploration and use of space. So it's great that we've got the director of the Space Development Agency, Dr. Dornier, here today. Before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsor, Maxar. Maxar delivers innovative, high-performing, and affordable solutions in space infrastructure and Earth intelligence. A leader in satellite manufacturing for LEO and GEO, Maxar has built 286 spacecraft for critical capabilities such as remote sensing and communications. Maxar's Worldview Legion Earth observation satellites launching later this year will enable revisit of the most rapidly changing areas on Earth more than 15 times per day. Maxar also supports decision makers directly with remote ground station support, 3D data and technology, AI for mission data processing, and more. Thank you, Maxar, for your sponsorship of today's event. Dr. Turnier, thank you so much for being with us today on Space Warfighter Talks. We really do appreciate you taking time out of what we know to be a very busy schedule. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. And sir, before we get going, I could either read your bio or I could let you just provide a brief introduction on yourself and your career and how you ended up as a director of the Space Development Agency. Certainly, certainly, I'll, I'll talk to that. So it's, a, you know, it is exciting time. So it's, a, there's no coincidence that uh, National Space Day comes a day after the National Day of Prayer, right? Because there's a lot of prayers that's involved to, to make space a reality. So it's an it's a exciting, exciting time. So I, I, my background, essentially, I've always been uh, interested in two things, uh, national security, uh, making, uh, you know, making uh, America a strong, safe nation, and, and then space. And it's, it's no coincidence that those two are, are just very tightly coupled. So my background, I, I'm, a, I'm a physicist by training, you know, I really I started out in, in astrophysics. That's, that's what I got my degree in. And, and from that point, you know, really going through grad schools when I started to look and say, okay, now uh, uh, we're arguing a lot about black holes and things like that. But, but realistically, most people, most people really don't care about that. So I wanted to, to stay focused on national security and kind of went in that path. And, and space is so tied to that. So from, from Los Alamos, I went to, to, uh, to uh, DARPA, spent four years at DARPA running primarily space programs, then went to IARPA doing the same thing, running space programs. And then it became clear really to, to know what you're doing and be able to run these programs properly within the government, you need to go out in industry. You need to go in industry, you need to, to, to actually be in industry for several years to get an understanding. That, that was something I didn't have an appreciation for, but, uh, but I, I, a lot of people gave me that advice. So my last role, I was in industry for seven years. My last role was director of R&D for Space and Intel for Harris Corporation. And a lot of what I learned there will transition and, and, and really lead into what we're trying to do with Space Development Agency. But basically from, from Harris, I came into uh, R&E to be the, uh, the assistant director for space. Now they're called principal director for space. And from that role then became the director of SDA running running just the, the best agency in the, in the government at this time. So it's really exciting times. It really is, sir. And, and before we get into the questions, I know you wanted to an opportunity to provide the audience a little bit of understanding of your organization. So I've got some slides here. I'll go ahead and share those and I'll let you talk through these slides and, and just tell me as we continue to uh, share this screen you know, how to move down to, you know, move on to the next section. So I'll go ahead and share that. Make sure you can see that, sir. And, and over to you. I can. Please go to the Innovator's Dilemma slide. The next slide. You got so it. As, I, as I mentioned, uh, Director of R&D at, at Harris Space and Intel. So that, that was my last role. And in that role, I had a very unique position. I, I needed to make sure that we could do the investment necessary to win the big programs that essentially kept the lights on and, and pushed the, the company forward. But at the same time, a large fraction of my business was the legacy Kodak group. And so uh, in, in talking with those folks, it, it became really clear what could happen uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your company had some technology that came out of nowhere, essentially, or, or a new market that came out of nowhere, and it could really disrupt your entire business, right? It, Kodak is a good example of that. So I also wanted to make sure that I could do research to develop products that would either create a disruption or in the very least prevent us from becoming disrupted. So I started to do a lot of research and I, I, 
really fell in love with the ideas in, in Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma. And in that book, he basically says, you look, you cannot do it. You cannot invest and develop products that uh, go after a mainline customer at the same time you invest and develop products to go after a new disruptive market. It just can't be done. And, and the whole book is talking about the reasons why it can't be done, but it boils down to resources, processes, and values. That's the three things that determine what you will focus on. And it all stems from the values. And if you are in a, in a large established company or a large established organization, you are going to focus on answering your established customers' needs, and you're going to give them a solution in a low risk, risk incremental approach. And that's going to be what, what keeps, your, keeps your business afloat. However, a disruptor is different. A disruptor does not have an established customer. They can take large risks and any win they have, even though it's a small win, is a big deal to them. So that will keep them driving forward and pushing. And eventually they'll be able to, to create a technology or a new market that can disrupt the old way of doing business. And that's the innovator's dilemma that's, that's essentially described in the book. And it says you cannot do one within the other. You have to have two separate organizations. That's where the Space Development Agency comes in. Space Development Agency is set up within the department to essentially be the constructive disruptor in space. So we are set up outside of the Space Force in a way that we can actually compete essentially with some of the ways that the Space Force is doing business. And obviously not in a destructive way. We're doing that to try to get a stronger space architecture overall. But essentially that allows the Space Force and the mainline acquisition arm in the Space Force, Space and Missile Center, soon to be Space Systems Command, to focus on answering the mail for their mainline customer, U.S. Space Command, and giving them a low-risk incremental approach that will continue to deliver the needs to the warfighters that, that we, ha we have. But Space Development Agency has set out to do something completely different. We were established to come up with a completely new space architecture. This architecture is based on two main pillars. Pillar number one is proliferation hundreds and hundreds of satellites. Those satellites, the proliferation is what gives you the, the resilience and then the, the timeliness or the persistence. That's pillar number one. Pillar number two is spiral development. And this is a big deal. What this means is we are going to field new capabilities every two years. We have a minimum viable product that we're going to field every two years, but by hook or by crook, those satellites are going up every two years, just like a bus stop. And we're going to put those new capabilities up with the technology that's available at the time. And then as technology matures and as new threats emerge, every two years we'll have a chance to spiral and improve those capabilities. So that's a completely new model based on if you compare that to the requirements driven model, uh, the JSIDS process that, that Space and Missile Center is, is kind of beholden to, to follow. And so that's what Space Development Agency was set up to do. Come up with a completely new architecture that is outside of the current realm in a way that hopefully disrupts the way the department does business in space so that we can stay ahead of the current threat, we can get the capabilities to the warfighter, and we can continue to deter and, if necessary, fight and win. So that's the mission of the Space Development Agency in a, in a, in a longer uh, overview. Now, this, this chart is just boiling it down. So the mission of SDA is speed, delivery, and agility, SDA. And that's what we're all about. So what I talked about, that architecture, it is all about providing the capabilities to the warfighter in an overall mission to give those capabilities in a, in, a, in a very fast, very efficient, and very agile manner. And so speed, delivery, agility. All right, so the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about what we're really focused on. So when I talk about capabilities, what, what do I mean? I've been a little nebulous to this point. There's two main capabilities that we're focused on. The first one is beyond line of sight targeting for ground and maritime time sensitive targets. So mobile missiles and ships, detect them, track them, calculate a fire control solution on those targets, and then send those data directly down to a weapons platform or even a weapon to be able to engage those targets. I want to do all of that in space, and I want to be able to close that chain in a single digit seconds. That's what we're focused on. Number two is the exact same mission, except now the targets are different. I'm not looking at mobile missiles and I'm not looking at ships. I'm looking at actual advanced missiles in flight. Detect them, track them, calculate a fire control solution, and then send that fire control solution down directly to an interceptor to be able to take out that target. Those are the two main mission areas that SDA is focused on. Everything we do ties back to being able to do these main mission areas. Now, a lot of, a lot of capabilities come along essentially for the ride. 
but this is kind of what we're what we're focused on. Now, in the next slide, the uh, the layered architecture approach talks about how we get there. So this is that overall architecture. Proliferation and spiral development are the two pillars, and those pillars feed into how we develop this architecture. The backbone is that blue transport box, if you see that icon there to the right. That's our transport layer. That is the low latency mesh network that is hundreds of satellites all connected via optical crosslinks. In addition, now that you have this mesh network, they also provide low latency comm down to the actual user. They provide that comm over existing tactical data links. Our starting tactical data link is link 16, just because it's the most prolific. But that will give you this mesh network. That is the department's vision for combined JADC2, CJADC2. We'll be able to tie all of these different networks together using that space, low latency backbone. That's the transport layer. Now inside the transport layer, you see that nav box. Essentially, that is alternative PNT that we get for free. What, what does that mean? Well, if I have this mesh network of these satellites all optically connected, I can calculate their position and time very accurately. I can then send those data down via that tactical data link so that a user can use that for an alternative position and time solution. That's great, that's the backbone. But then the power of the architecture comes when you start to add in all of these other sensor data. So off to the right are the sensor layers. The first one at the top is tracking. That's the OPIR, Overhead Persistent Infrared Imaging Layer. That's our missile tracking layer. So that one is being built out uh, by a Space Development Agency and Missile Defense Agency essentially to provide that, that detection those data would then go to transport. Transport would fuse those data and send that down to the weapons platform. Next one down is custody. That is our target custody. That is our ISR layer, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Those are sets of satellites that provide any kind of, any kind of surveillance. So those could be RF SIGINT-like satellites. Those could be RF radar imagery satellites. Those could be electro-optical satellites. SDA is actually not building out any of those satellites. What we are doing, we are working with mission partners both inside and outside the government. So a lot of these are commercial entities so that they can provide their data directly from their sensing system into our transport layer so then they can be fused together and then sent down to a weapons platform. So that's how the custody layer works. Then the third one down, that's emerging capabilities. Essentially, we have a, a lot of different uh, uh, longer term areas that, that we are investigating. This used to be called deterrence and it was focused mostly on space situational awareness. That's still part of emerging capabilities, but in emerging capabilities, we also have things such as, such as weather to be able to see what missions we could perform in future tranches that's investigated through emerging capabilities. Now what ties all these together is that gray box that's around all of the layers, battle management. So in order to do this mission, I need this mesh network to act autonomously I need it to be able to actually fuse data and calculate target, targeting solutions in, in near real time. That's the battle management. Those are processors that exist primarily on the transport satellites, but allow this computation to happen over, over essentially a space battle cloud is what uh, SMC used to, used to call it. So we'll have that federated processing be done over hundreds of satellites and then fed back in to the transport layer comm network so that it can be sent down to a weapons platform. And then of course we have support. Support is our, obviously we've got to launch these satellites. We've got to have ground for command and control of these satellites. And then if there is any special user equipment that falls underneath our support cell. That is the SDA layer that what we call the national defense space architecture, the layered approach in a nutshell. All right, the next slide we'll talk about, uh, you know, what, what, what we're planning on doing when. So that's the overall architecture. This is what we're doing and then in the near term, this year, we're going to, to launch about five satellites that are doing demonstrations. And these are teamed, we're teamed with, with DARPA, AFRL, and MDA to be able to, to do these missions, to be able to demonstrate that we can do these optical crosslinks in affordable means. So essentially using commoditized buses and commoditized optical crosslinks. We've got, uh, we've got two sets of two satellite each demos going up on Transporter 2. So those will go up at the end of June. And then we also have uh, some satellites going up to demonstrate that we can do uh, low earth orbiting or, or LEO missile tracking. So we're, we're working with some, some partners to be able to, to demonstrate that. That's all part of our demonstration work. The real work comes in tranche zero. That's when we launch our first mesh network that starts at, no, still on this, still on this chart, please. 
Yeah. So this is still a schedule here. So if you see that uh, that tranche zero there, we see that the 20 transport satellites and the eight wide field of view satellites, that those are the 28 satellites that make up tranche zero. So those are the 20 mesh network transport satellites. Some of those also have link 16 connectivity to theater. And then the eight wide field of view are OPIR. The whole point of tranche zero is to demonstrate a capability so that the warfighter can start to use that in their TTPs so that once we get to tranche one, which is down there on the bottom, now we're looking at 150 satellites or so, that's when we can actually start to affect a fight. We want the warfighter to already have been using our tranche zero satellites in their exercises so they're ready when they come online in 2024. Now the next slide talks about uh, you know, the details of, of tranche zero. So tranche zero is made up of the, the transport. Transport has A and B. The A satellites have four optical crosslinks, so they can talk in plane and cross plane. The B satellites have two optical crosslinks to talk in plane, but then the other two optical uh, crosslinks are removed and they're replaced with a Link 16 COM package that allows us to talk directly from space into terrestrial and airborne Link 16, Link 16 networks. And then the tracking is our wide field of view system to demonstrate that we can do detection and tracking of hypersonic glide vehicle class um, advanced missiles, track them, calculate a track, send it to transport. Transport then can send that down either, either to the ground, so for dissemination over C2 BMC, or directly down to a weapons platform to engage the target. That's the, the tranche zero architecture in a, in a nutshell. Now the next slide, talks about you know, exactly what, what we've been up to and, and what we're kind of planning on doing in the, in the near term. So these are all of the acquisitions uh, actions that we've taken. And, and essentially the, the bottom line here is that SDA is not messing around. We have all of the, the contracts on, on co all of our contractors on contract for tranche zero on firm fixed price uh, contracts to push forward to deliver. September, 2022 is when we will, that's just over 72 weeks from now, we're going to be launching these capabilities. We delivered the first two satellites. We delivered them to the launch vehicle nine months after we received funds. We're all about speed. Our, our motto is Semper Sidious, always faster. All right, and then so that the, the key thing to keep in mind moving forward is, is Tranche Zero is, is kind of already, already going, executing, but we're about to start Tranche One. So for Tranche One, that's this 150 or so transport satellites that will be launched starting in September of 2024. We will have an RFP hit the street for that in August of this year. And then we plan to have those on those performers on contract in January of 2022. So that's the, the next thing out of the gate. We've got several RFIs that are, that are open right now with some that have just closed that are helping us shape that RFP. We actually plan on having a draft RFP come out in June and then the final come out in August. So please, Please uh, be aware of that and, and watching that. That's, that's going to be an exciting time. All right, and then so I'll just leave you with, with the motto that I've already mentioned. Semper Sidious means always faster. That's our official, official motto. In addition to that, we have an unofficial motto. Better is the enemy of good enough. So the, the key thing is always to focus on getting these capabilities up and operational as, as rapidly as possible. We will trade performance for schedule to make sure that we can maintain, maintain that. And one of the, one of the key, key items there, people always talk to me uh, aside and say, are you sure that's, that's the right, right model? And I say, yes. And there was a, we had, we had an employee that, that said something, I think he said it very profoundly, and I, I like to quote him on it, uh, Mike Schlachter. And what he said was, cost, performance, schedule. Who cares about each one? So cost within the department, uh, the primary person that cares about that one is, is CAPE. They want to make sure that, uh, that, that the cost is, is correct and, and under control. And then performance, who cares about performance? Usually that's the program manager. They want to make sure that they can hit everything that, uh, that, that they want. They want to get the last ounce of performance out of their program as possible. But schedule, who cares about schedule? And his point was the warfighter is the one that cares about schedule. Because no matter how good or how affordable a program or a platform is, if it is not there when you need it, it's worthless. And so that's why... Semper Sidious, we're always focused on schedule and we're going to get these capabilities up and on time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you going over that because I, I think a lot of people have that question about SDA. You know, what is SDA doing specifically? Um, I tell you from a fail fast perspective, 
do you just watch these starship launches at spacex and cringe every time that thing starts to land and then just blows up do you just go oh my goodness i don't know how he's able to do that but is that an example of failing fast and is there that philosophy in sda to look at that and go we need to work towards that or, or what's your approach towards that kind of um testing oh it's exactly right so if you if you look at if you look at starship so uh, the fifth one, they they landed without blowing up, and That's so uh, you know the 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 so you have to ask yourself as as long as as long as now they know that they can do it on six, seven, and eight, then then it was a big success. Obviously, if if uh, one out of five is successful going forward, then then they didn't learn the lessons. But but that, that that's the way. If you look at if you look at all those old videos about how we did space, there were a lot of rockets that blew up on the pad. It's exactly right. You you cannot get in a in a mode where where you try to drive all the risk out and you push out the capability, you push out the capability, you increase the cost until you can really convince yourself that there's no risk left. You just have to push forward, get the capabilities up there, learn from that, and then continue to drive. And if, if you look at the timing of our spiral development model, it's interesting because, so we're going to have our tranche one on contract, you know, r- roughly nine months before our tranche zero launches. People can say, well, well, wait a minute. Why don't you wait until tranche zero launches, fly it for a year, then put tranche one up and do that? Well, that's not really a spiral model. That's more of a, of a, of a step model. And, and all that is going to do is, is delay when you get the ultimate capabilities. We are going to, we, we obviously learned enough during tranche zero that when we go out for the tranche one solicitation, it has all of the lessons baked in essentially up to CDR for our tranche zero. And, and after that, the lessons we learned from tranche zero will fold, fold into to tranche two, and then from tranche one, we'll fold into tranche three and we'll continue to, to go. That's what we focus on, right? This is the mentality people have to have to realize about SDA. We're not focused on getting the, the newest, latest technology fielded. We're focused on getting the technology that is ready today fielded, you know, in 18 to 24 months. Uh, and so that's a, that's a different mentality. So we're already starting out in, in a method that says, okay, this is, we, we already have a proven system, proven technology, and we're ready to go. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate you going over uh, that and providing that perspective in terms of the timeline, because everyone knows that it really is about the timeline. And to your point, how quickly can we get capability to the warfighter? And so I, I always love having the discussion with folks about, you know, defining the space warfighter. And, and the way I think about it is, it's the, the men and women, the Space Force guardians that are sitting on console every day providing capability uh, to other terrestrial domains and also protecting and defending capabilities in the space domain. How, how would you look at the space warfighter and how do you get and how do you communicate with them to be able to test out these new capabilities that you're developing? No, that, that, that's true. That's exactly right. Now, one of the key things that, uh, that SDA focuses on are, you know, if we, if we we're customer focused and our customer is all of the COCOMs. Now that, that obviously one of the COCOM space command, they're focused on the space domain, but you have the, the rest of the terrestrial COCOMs that have their AOR and they are, their AOR is, is focused on terra firma. So when we talk about, you know, when we talk about providing these capabilities, that's, that's really where the, where the war is, is going to be, going to be felt. It'll be fought in all domains, but it's really going to be felt here on, on Earth. And so that's, that's the way we look at it. We look at it as the, the purpose of, of the space community is to make sure that we can have these assured capabilities that the, the warfighters need across all of the, all of the AORs to perform, their, to perform their mission and do it when they're called on to do it. And so that, that's the way, that's the way we, we look at it is, you know, people can say, well, okay, so you're, you're in a supporting role. Yes. Uh, in, in essence, it is a supporting role, but it's a supporting role that, that makes sure that, the, that the, the men and women that are, that are actually in the fight can rely on the capabilities and know that everything they've trained, everything they've trained with will be with them when they need it. That's perfect. That's exactly, uh, that's, a, that's a great message to the space warfighters out there. Folk, uh, sir, I'm getting questions from folks asking if these slides can be shared. Is there any problem with me sharing these slides on our website after our discussion today? It, it says that it's uh, distribution unlimited and approved for public release, but I just want to make sure that's okay. It's okay with me. Okay, perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, 
the National Defense Space Architecture, as you talked about, is designed as seven layers. The transport layer is in development along with key enabling technology, optical communication terminals, sometimes called optical inter-satellite links or OISLs. What advantages are realized from the NDSA from the development of OISL technologies? Certainly. So go back to those, go back to those main two capabilities, right? I want to be able to get targeting and I want to be able to get missile defeat, missile targeting. I want to be able to do that all in real time. And, and the, limits, the limits to that are being able to move sensor data as rapidly as possible. The laser crosslinks allow you to have high bandwidth communication so that you can actually have those big pipes to move a lot of that data. In addition to that, now I, I'm not, I'm not uh, just trying to get someone so that they can, they can watch Netflix at, at home. I'm actually trying to, to get a system that is in place where we're actually in a time of war, I can have a calm path that's reliable. And so the laser crosslinks also give you a method that is, is inherently, obviously it's, it's not 100%, but it's inherently low probability of intercept, low probability of detection, and very, very anti-jam. It's extremely difficult to jam an optical crosslink, right? You have to, you have to in sense be in, in that beam. So it, it not only gives you the resilience, but it gives you the, the very high bandwidth that gives you the low latency. And so that, that's why we went with the optical crosslinks. Thank you, sir. The transport layer is the early focus, as you, as you discussed, for the NDSA. Can you make projections on how long it will take for SDA to move from its vision for the NDSA to a complete architecture with all seven layers operating at a minimum viable product level? Sure. So the, uh, the key thing to keep in mind there is um, the minimum viable product will, will always be defined per each tranche. And in the spiral development model, we're, we're never done. We, we're, we're always working on the, the next capability, the, ne the next tranche and, and the next instantiation. But I, I'll, so I'll, I'll break that up and say, when, you know, when, will be, when will we be ready to affect fights at different levels? So tranche one will have persistence over regional coverage for that low latency comm. Primarily uh, our tranche one is modeled after making sure that we can get the, the link 16 coverage, global coverage, uh, so that so that we could focus it on given regions of the globe as as threats arise. So that you know 2024. Now the next big step is okay. Now when when can we actually start to to move a lot of this targeting data from new sensing systems? Well, in that 2024 timeframe, we're going to have a lot of mission partners that are coming on board with their different ISR constellations. This is both commercial and and other government mission partners. So those will be fed in. So we'll be able to have custody feeding those data in directly in that 2024 timeframe for persistent regional coverage, not you know, global persistence at the time. Then uh, in 2026, when we come up with tranche two, then we'll have global persistence. So now we can, we can basically have that, take that fight anywhere on the globe 24 seven to be able to give you the persistence for ISR and the persistence for that low latency comm. Now, as far as the missile tracking mission, that's a, that's a little different timeframe. I would say that uh, the department essentially I uh, wanted to pump the brakes on, on missile tracking when, when they first told us to go forward. They said, go as fast as you can on transport and tie that in with, with the mission partners in custody and, and make that happen. But, but tracking, we want you to fly tranche zero first, take some data, and then we'll decide on what to do for, for tranche one. So tranche one, essentially, and obviously we're pushing the bubble on that, trying to, trying to drive that as fast as, as we can. But I would say tracking is 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 lagging transport by at least a year, if not two, in being able to give you that persistence over a given region and then finally that global coverage. So everything I said for transport, add one or two years, and then that's when you have the, the tracking coverage. Thank you. Sir, you talked about the fact that you're moving faster than the standard acquisition cycle. And, and there are quite a few acquisition organizations out there. You're, you're one of, of several You've got the Space and Missile System Center, as you talked about. You've got the Air Force Rapid Capability Office. You've got the Space Rapid Capability Office. You have the National Reconnaissance Office and Missile, Missile Defense Agency. I, I learned, we learned in a interview with Colonel Turnbull over at SMC a few weeks ago about what's called the Program Integration Council. And it's designed to enable cooperation across these organizations. Can you provide insight into the PIC and how the process works? Sure. So I'll, I'll provide insight by, by using a, an example. So essentially the, the, the PIC, as we call it, 
is a, a group of us. We, we, we meet monthly and we talk about our, our, our programs and, and roadmaps and then make sure that, that we, can, we can have synergies where, where we need them. One of the examples of that is, is, is pretty obvious and that's in the, the transport layer. So if we're fielding this mesh network of optical comm, and if other mission partners, you know, the, the ones you, you mentioned are also are fielding uh, different, different satellites uh, in, in different orbital regimes, doing different missions. Well, wouldn't it make a lot of sense if we could all talk to the transport layer to make sure that we all had a, a, a uniform way to, to meet an optical standard so that we could do that, that low latency comm amongst each other. And so that's one of the things we discussed at the pick is, okay, this is, you know, SDA will say this is the, you know, this is the optical comm standard that we're going forward with. We chose it because it's essentially the way industry is moving and we can get commoditized parts. Uh, and then we'll work with those mission partners who are also members of the PIC to say, okay, now this is, this is what, this is the kind of modem and, and optical crosslink you would need to be able to tie into that so that we can make sure our, our programs are all synced up. So we do the same thing, you know, we, uh, same thing when it comes to, to missile warning, missile tracking. That's one of the topics we talk about at the PIC to make sure that we're all kind of synced up and all pushing forward in this constructive disruptor way from SDA's model or just a constructive synergy way if, if we're taking a more incremental approach. That's, that's kind of the purpose of the PIC. Okay, now that does provide some clarity on it. And is there any report that folks could get access to that allow them to see the prioritized efforts from an acquisition community, even from a priority one down through maybe a priority 10? Is that something that's being explored? So there's a little more transparency in the capabilities that are being developed. So um, I don't really know the answer to that. And the reason, the reason I, I, you know, obviously that sounds like something that uh, in the acquisition community, we should, we should say, yes, there is. The, the problem is that uh, to put all of the pieces and parts together and show the, the complete picture, uh, it, it, it gets, it gets classified very quickly. And, and so with those, those kind of roadmaps and overall pictures uh, are, you know, they, they do exist. They exist at different levels. I would, I would actually contend that there are, um, within the department, there's also, there's also a, a group that is, is, is charged with making sure that a lot of these capabilities and the roadmaps of the capabilities, uh, are, are kind of defined and on track. And that, if you remember in my, when I, when I started this talk, when I first came into the, to the Pentagon was as the assistant director for space. Well, now that's the principal director of space. That's Dr. Lindsay Millard. So underneath R&E, there are 11 modernization priorities. And there is a principal director for each of those modernization areas. One of those is space. And that's in essence what that principal director's job is to do, is to make sure that there is a unified roadmap across all of the department and that everybody uh, is, is kind of pushing forward in, in these areas. So I would say, you know, the roadmap, the roadmap that I always try to focus on, I try to, I try to bend the roadmap in the following ways. What do we use space for? P&T, COM, ISR, and then, and then space warfare, if you will. So there are roadmaps in each of those four areas kind of show what groups are, are investing in, what are the programs of record, and what are the, the different R&D projects that will feed that later roadmap in those kind of four, four areas. And, and that's, that's kind of the way, way we try to, try to bid it. Great, I think I appreciate that, Dr. Turnier. What unique value does SDA employ that sets it apart from the other acquisition organizations that we spoke about? And how does that help inform the drive across DOD for space acquisition reform? I know that's been a big talk, at, talk of late, a big topic of late, but how is that driving that space acquisition reform that we know we need? So a lot of, I go back to the innovator's dilemma, resources, processes, and values. When you, when you hear a lot of talk about space acquisition reform, the first thing people usually go to is processes. And then maybe they'll talk about resources. Obviously, you know, if we only had more resources, we could make this happen. Or, but uh, that's, that's starting backwards. So if you look at what we've done and how we've moved so quickly, we have used standard FAR-based contracting. We have not used OTAs. Uh, we've, we've just done everything just following uh, standard RFPs and we've been able to go extremely quickly. Uh, when you start to say, and that doesn't mean that there's not a, you know, there's not a, a, a time and place for OTAs and they can't give you good things. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's not generally the holdup. The holdup is back in the values. 
and and as and you really need to start from from square one and say I'm going to value putting these capabilities up on this time frame above all, and that will make you look and say, okay, what what do I have on the shelf that I can I can get up there as rapidly as possible? And that's the difference. And and so that I will say that uh, I don't think that you want all of the space acquisition to necessarily follow the, the same way SDA is doing it. I think you wanna have these, these separate entities, right? The way, the, the example that, that we use a lot is when you're on the monkey bars, you wanna make sure that you, you have a hold of the one monkey bar before you let go of the second one. And that's the whole disruptive. We don't wanna get into a state where we're, we're on tra trapeze, where you let go and you know, you're, you're grabbing to try to, try to get the other, other rung. So there are, there's, I, I would say that acquisition reform has to start by looking at what is valued in each one. If you if you go back to your your uh, Starship example, you know SDA SDA will have failures. We'll have we'll have satellites that fail on orbit. We'll have we'll have setbacks, and that's our risk posture. And we'll move on. And everybody's kind of expecting us to to have a certain level of, of failure and continue to push forward. If you had if you had SMC for example, if they had a Starship blow up on the pad that would be a, a huge deal for them because they're, they're, the level of, of scrutiny based on the way they're doing business is much different. And, and that's, you know, nothing that, that's, that's, more, that's, that's more of a burden for SMC than it is a, a, a problem that exists in S SMC. Just based on where they are in that innovator's dilemma cycle, they're on the top curve. Their risk tolerance by definition has to be a lot lower and we can have a higher risk tolerance. So as far as the acquisition reform that we need, I think the key thing is just to, just to make sure everybody realizes that you cannot have a one size fits all. You need to have a constructive disruptor and that constructive disruptor has to be separated enough so that you can in fact have these two models that yes, yes, they're competing, but competition will give you the best architecture overall, right? It'll give you the best price for a gallon of milk. It'll get you the best national defense space architecture. Thank you. Uh, if, if it's okay, and, and the reason why we love doing these live interviews is to take questions from the audience. So we've got quite a few questions here. If you don't mind, I'll just roll through a few of these. Uh, just to, And if you can't answer them, great. If you can't, completely understand. The Space Force recently awarded Phase 1 Small Business Innovation Research Cyber Awards in preparation for a Space Force Pitch Day in August. Is SDA involved in the process in, in any way or interested in industry solutions and work? So SDA has its own uh, SIBRs and we had our own solicitation for, for SIBRs to topics and, and we're going through that solicitation now. So I'm not, I'm not uh, heavily involved in, in what the, the Space Force has been doing on the, on the SIBR side. Okay, thank you, sir. Do you envision the BMC3 solution to be compliant with OMS UCI or show a path for compliance for OMS UCI? So we are actually, so I'll take it one step further and I'll talk about the whole, the whole EGS solution space. So uh, we, are, we, are using, we are using NRL for our tranche zero to be able to do our ground primarily so that everything we do is, is going to be compatible with EGS when it, when it finally comes off the line. As far as uh, OMS for, for different uh, uh, missile tracking activities and things like that, we're going to be compatible and, and working along, along that lines. But, it, but uh, that's, that's really the way we're working towards compatibility across the board. Okay, thank you, sir. I've got one that talks about the importance of data. Uh, I know everyone, we talk about moving data around. What are your thoughts on a data standardization ver versus kind of an open architecture standard uh, data, um, you know, uh, way to look at data? And I know General Raymond has uh, basically said that, hey, if you want to share data, with the Space Force, you're going to be using the Unified Data Library. Are you examining the use of the Unified Data Library? Yes. So all of our, you know, all of our data will be will will be in a form that that we can we can ingest directly into to tactical systems, right? And and the only way you can do that if it's already in if it's already able to be distilled down into to some standardized form. We're not going to obviously change any of the architecture of Link 16 and JRE messages. So we need to make sure that everything can eventually conform to that. As I mentioned for the for the missile tracking mission, that eventually has to be broadcast out via C2BMC. So we need to make sure that we can 
we can put that into the format, those OMS message formats, so that those can be broadcast out via IBS and, and those. So for those type of systems, we, we need to make sure that yeah, you, you have to you have to you have to meet data standards to be able to be, share data. All right, thank you. And is SDA planning to enable communications beyond Link 16? Will you be considering a 5G architecture in the future? Yes, so uh, Link 16 is the first tactical data link, and that's just because it's the most prolific. But our plan in, in Tranche 1 is actually to start to build out into, into to S-band and UHF for, for, for other tactical data links. And then, you know, when, when we get to Tranche 2, that would likely be the standard. So we would have UHF, S-band, and, and Link 16 to go down to a, a variety of different different waveforms and tactical data links. As far as 5G, so it's interesting because when I think of 5G, there's two, two main components to 5G. There's the edge processing component, and then there's the actual millimeter wave comm, comm channel. We, we don't have any plans to do the second part. There are no plans to do millimeter wave comm from space to, to ground actually be able to, to be a 5G point. But the first part, so the edge processing, we are leveraging uh, all of the developments that have been done in the community on edge processing and, and those algorithms that is going to feed into and, and, and build into what is our BMC cube processor that makes up that battle management layer. Thank you, sir. The, and low earth orbit, as you described, is often described as the most vulnerable orbit for denial, disruption and destruction. Do you have a view and what is your perspective on the strategy, strategy to assure the capabilities that you described? So I, uh, two things, but first I, I actually, I actually take exception to the premise, right? So it's, uh, it's, I, I'm not sure that it's the most vulnerable. If I have a satellite that's, that's just always sitting in one location and I pretty much know where it is, I can, I can go up and touch it if I, if I want to a lot easier than, than something in, in Leo. Now in Leo, obviously you're, you're, uh, you're more vulnerable to, to, you're more vulnerable to, uh, to, to laser and, uh, and, and missile threats, uh, but, I, I would contend that the you know some of those threats are, are pretty easy to mitigate, and we've got some some ideas on on how to mitigate that. Again, extremely affordable mitigation techniques that really swap the the price point. That it, it takes you it costs you a lot more to shoot down a satellite than the satellite is actually cost to, to build and and operate and, and get on orbit. So that that's kind of what we're going for. So the biggest part of resiliency that we're we're advocating is just the proliferation. Right, we're going to have hundreds of these satellites, and that in and of itself makes you resilient. And that's really similar to a Starlink model, isn't it, sir? Where Elon Musk has basically said, I'm just going to distribute a lot of satellites, and over the course of time, they are going to degrade, which, uh, which allows him to introduce new and emerging technology into that capability, which overall provides a much better consolation of capability uh, to the user. So is that a similar approach where you're going to evolve new technology quickly and design the capability to degrade over time and then replenish it very quickly? Exactly. I mean, every two years we'll fill new capabilities. For Starlink, you know, they, they have something like 1,300 satellites up now. Uh, obviously, they, they, they keep it pretty close hold on how many of those are fully operational and how many aren't. Uh, so you, you hear all these people that make estimates on how many percentage of failures they've had. But in the end, it... It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's how are you able to provide the service? And for our low latency comm, we, we could lose uh, several, several satellites and, and not have an impact. Same as, same as the Starlink model. That's great to hear, sir. You mentioned, and this really kind of leads into this next question, you mentioned that tracking layer will incorporate data feeds directly from commercial assets. What's your position or SDA's position regarding the balance between U.S. government-owned capabilities versus utilizing commercial capabilities and assets? And how will the U.S. government incentivize commercial industry's response to meeting low margin U.S. government needs? Sure. So uh, the custody layer, the custody layer is our ISR layer, and that's the one where we're working directly. There are there are folks that are fielding commercial SAR, commercial SIGINT capabilities. And what we want to do is we want to work with them so that we can put on uh, a SDA compatible crosslink to tie directly into our satellites. And, and from their perspective, that's great because now it's a lot easier for me to buy that as a service from them. So in, in essence, I am enabling them another channel to that, that same market. And so they, that, that's, how, that's how we wanna work with the commercial entities. Now, as far as where do, where do we draw that line? We are, not, 
we are not building this, this system out, uh, the National Defense Space Architecture, so that it can, can provide these capabilities only in peacetime. We're not building these capabilities out so that it can provide just the Title 50 Intel mission that we can get the data down when we need to, make sure we analyze it. We're pro providing, we're building this out so that it can meet the no kidding Title 10 war mission under, under conflict, under attack, under threat, uh, the worst day. And so there are, there are, there are a few key things that, that you need to, to keep in mind. So I look at the sensors and the transport. So sensors, I want to use any and all commercial sensors, work with them as long as we can, you know, do the right cyber handshakes and make sure that, that everything is good there to get the data on without, you know, uh, opening up cyber vulnerabilities. I'll pull that data from commercial all day long. For the transport to be able to get that tactical data directly down to a weapon or a weapons platform, that the government really has to have that in control and own that for, for primarily, primarily a, a few main reasons. One, I, I need to make sure that there is no uh, ulterior uh, motives pulling the operation of those satellites. You know, this is not saying that there would be anything nefarious done by any commercial operator, but they you know, they have to, in the end of the day, they'll have to answer to their shareholders. And those answers may not be the same as what we need in a, in a tactical fight on any given day. So that's, that, that's number one. Number two, there are some very specific requirements that we need in a tactical environment. So link 16 obviously is, is, is very specific to the to the Department of Defense. You're not going to have a lot of commercial uses for that. So that's one of the things that, that we will field and operate that there's not a commercial market for. And then number three, we cannot get vendor lock, right? I need to make sure that I have this open standard, open architecture that anybody can plug and play in, but the government owns the overall architecture so that we can ensure that every two years we can have new vendors come in. There's a market that's steady and stable and that any new entrant can feel comfortable investing in knowing that they could compete and win. And it's not just locked into a single vendor. So that's, that's kind of where I draw the line. Sensors, commercial all day long, transport. I want the government for those three reasons. Perfect. Thank you, sir. I've got a question here that's asking about which tranche will begin providing alternative PNT signals to user equipment. So the alternative PNT, as we have envisioned, keep in mind, is a, is a message that goes down. It's a nav message over an existing tactical data link. We don't have any plans in the, in the current tranches. And keep in mind, we're, we're basing our tranches off what's commercially available, what the given threats are. And so anything beyond tranche two is, is still just whiteboard. We could put anything in there. But uh, for tranche, tranche one, so if tranche zero, our goal for PNT is to be able to show that we can, we can do uh, two-way timing transfer and, and we'll be able to take the data and show that we can, we can run that and, and we'll do that offline. Tranche one is to try to show that we can do that two-way timing transfer on orbit and, and then the stretch goal to be able to calculate a, an alternative PNT signal on orbit. Tranche two then is when we would actually start to embed that signal into a link 16 message so that we could send that down as an alternative PNT for folks that already had a, a, a link 16 radio or were on our KA or our, our laser links down. We don't have plans to actually broadcast out uh, an alternative PNT like GPS does, primarily because keep in mind, we're trying to keep these satellites small and affordable and just the power aperture, right? If you want to go over a very large area and put a decent signal down, you know, it, it takes more power for your satellite to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned the exercises that you're currently involved in. Could you explain the exercises that you're demonstrating these capabilities in and how you're getting feedback from those exercises to imp improve that process? So there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different, uh, so keep, we're gonna launch September, 2022, and we're going to, uh, that's, one launch September 22, the second launch in March of 2023, and then we'll essentially have our tranche zero operating through 2023, 2024 before our tranche one launches. There are several different several different uh, uh, exercises that the COCOMs are running uh, on that time frame. And if you just look at their schedules and you can see which which exercises are, are taking place, there'll be SCA assets in in place on almost all. Okay, yes, sir. That clear, clears up Pfizer for me in that uh, you're actually in, integrating with the combatant commands exercise plan and actually providing that capability to them during those exercises, uh, which obviously is the way to get tremendous warfighter feedback. So it's great. Sir, I really can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to the Space Force Association about what 
the Space Development Agency is currently working on and your vision for the future and how you're integrating the most you know, uh, critical technology in support of developing the necessary capabilities to support the warfighter as quickly as possible. Sir, any closing comments? Just thank you for the opportunity and it was happy to spend National Space Day with you. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise, sir. Have a great, have a great day. Semper Supra. <laughs> Semper Sidious. Semper Sidious, that's right. Okay, sir. Talk soon. Thanks. Bye now.